Dan's going to lead off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'll stand up to introduce myself. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Ben Gray. I'm a fisheries research assistant here at the Science Center. Um, the past two years, I've been working on the herring tagging and tracking program, and mm -hmm. I've been working on that with uh, Mary Ann Bishop. And tonight, we're going to um, present some of our uh, results, uh, talk about how to tag a herring, uh, why you'd want to do so, uh, where they have been going. Um, so go ahead and get into that. Um, so what we'll cover tonight, um, get a little background on the herring uh, research and monitoring program, and then how the tagging program fits into that. Oh, and I, I meant to say that this is informal, so if you guys have questions, please just um, say, oh, say something. Right. Um, oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so yeah, um, we'll give a little bit of an overview on telemetry. Oh yeah, we just started. So, yeah. <laughs> We're honored. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> but uh, we'll give an overview on telemetry methods. And when I say telemetry, I'm really just saying um, a, a device, a transmitter that's either been put in or on an animal and it's being tracked using a device. Um, talk about the tags that we use uh, to track the herring, uh, the receiver mooring designs that we use. Um, talk a bit about where the receivers are located and show some maps. Uh, we'll get into some of the herring capture methods and then I'll show a video of the surgery. And then we'll get a little idea after all of that together, some insight into the uh, migration cycle for 2017. 2018 for a few of the uh, fish that returned. So I think as most everyone here in the room knows, uh, the, the herring uh, population in Prince William Sound uh, had a catastrophic collapse in the 90s and uh, has never uh, recovered uh, since then. And um, do, out of that, the Exxon Valdez Oil Spill Trustee Council uh, brought forth the Herring Research and Monitoring Program with a goal to improve uh, the ability to predict, to predict changes in the herring population. And this uh, research and monitoring program is just a mix of uh, monitoring studies, uh, including acoustic surveys, aerial, age sur aerial and age surveys, disease research, reproductive maturity research, and then um, herring migration studies, which is what we're going to talk about some today. The tagging program uh, gives information into the annual uh, herring migration cycle. From, from the tagging, you can get ideas of the location, the timing, uh, the direction of movements between Prince William Sound and the Gulf of Alaska. Um, find out some about the movements between the spawning, feeding, and overwintering areas. And the hopes of this is this data that we generate from um, our study will contribute to some of the other herring projects, uh, especially some of the disease work that's going on in the modeling and uh, stock assessment. I'm just going to go into briefly into some of the popular methods of fish tagging and tracking uh, that folks use um, and why we didn't use a particular method over one or the other. Um, Radio telemetry is a popular method. Um, it's primarily an active tracking method. It's not totally active. Um, sometimes there are uh, people use like radio towers to tag uh, or to track tagged animals. For the most part, it's an active method, and it works best in fresh water. Um, it, it doesn't really work well with uh, marine conditions. Uh, the conductivity of salt water just doesn't allow radio telemetry to work that well. And it doesn't work well at shallow depth, so this is not the method that we would want to use for herring. And just to give an idea of what this looks like, here's a picture of um, some folks doing some active tracking in a boat with a uh, large antenna, and presumably tracking um, some fish that they tagged. But uh, you can see that they are uh, in the in a river uh, lake type environment. <coughs> um, satellite telemetry is another uh, popular method. Satellite tags are really cool. Uh, they uh, can get you, give you a lot of information, uh, temperature, depth, movement data. And they're also pretty cool because they pop off at a predetermined time and transmit data to, to uh, 
the satellites, so you can really key in on a specific life history trait you want to check on or see in the fish, and then have it only track during that time. Um, problem is they're just too large for herring, and too expensive for a large scale study. These tags cost thousands of dollars. Um, here's a picture of a fish that uh, I tagged. With, uh, it's a Dolly Varden, or I helped tag with a friend of mine on the Beaufort Coast. But you can see that these are quite large. Um, they are a neutrally buoyant tag, but they um, they are large, and they don't get they don't get very much smaller than this. And you just really couldn't use them on herring. Um, and we were we were dealing with sample sizes in the tens um, in this project, and we're dealing with sample sizes on the hundreds for this project. So just not not a method we would use. So. What we do use is called passive acoustic telemetry. Um, the basic idea is you put an acoustic receiver in a specific location, uh, fish or tag with an internal transmitter, and then they're detected by a receiver uh, where you put the uh, where you put the receiver. Um, these are nice, you know. There's a flexible study design. Uh, there's a variety of different types of tags and receiver types that really can meet a variety of study designs. Um, they do work well in marine conditions and at greater depths. And it's a method we use. Um, so in this person's hand, there's just an idea of what these tags look like and what uh, size uh, you, they are. We, we use uh, mainly these V9s and V8s that you see with the circle. Um, they are uh, a good size for the herring that we tag. Um, uh, and so these tags, what they do is they produce a, a low frequency sound signal or a ping, and that ping is a, it's a, a coded acoustic transmission. And these uh, particularly um, are on a frequency of uh, 69 kilohertz, and they're at a straight signal at um, 144 to 151 decibels. <coughs> From these tags, so tag in this person's right hand, acoustic receiver in the uh, left hand. Um, these tags uh, emit the ping uh, and these specialized hydrophones detect and decode signals from the tags. So this is just a, the basic animation here of how this works. The detection data um, gets taken in through the hydrophone and then it gets uh, put into or not put, uh, taken down by the receiver uh, through a computer motherboard, basically. And um, we can then uh, upload or download this data at will. And this, this particular model of a receiver, we can just download all the detection data using a Bluetooth key and a connection to a computer. <clears throat> In Prince William Sound, we use two different types of acoustic moorings uh, designs. Um, one of the designs that we use are a long-term design and they're meant to go down for five or more years. Uh, these are a great design for really dynamic areas uh, where yearly retrieval would be difficult. So areas like Hinchinbrook Entrance, Montague Strait, it's nice to be able to put a receiver down and just not you know, have to uh, refurbish it uh, yearly. Um, these, you hover over the excuse me, you hover over them in a boat and uh, upload them via a transducer cable to the computer. This is a, just a general schematic of how this will all work. And while I have it up, we can kind of go through the whole process. But these long-term moorings, they're on a, uh, this is a, a flotation collar. So it's, it's the buoyancy that's bringing up the receiver in the water column. It's on a uh, uh, anchor weight. And um, these orbs coming off along here, kind of just showing the, uh, the detection uh, radius of these receivers. The particular ones that we have out uh, can get anywhere from about 500 to 700 meters uh, detection efficiency, depending on the ocean conditions. So the, the ocean conditions get worse, the detection efficiency gets worse. But the idea is to Assemble or put these receivers in a line so you have um, you have no gaps in your detection efficiency. Uh, so that's what we've done in our areas that we have receivers. 
And then here's the general idea of a tagged fish being picked up by these receivers. And then just we're in, in the boat uh, with a transducer cable. Uh, yes? Uh, do you ever pick up fish you don't expect, like, you know, a Chinook that was tagged down south that just comes up here? And do you ever, like, get things that aren't supposed to be there? Is that, or yeah. Never a Chinook, but we have picked up salmon sharks. Uh, there's a uh, lab in uh, Stanford that uh, tagged some salmon sharks back in 2015. And some of those tags that they have, they're so, they're large and they have battery power that lasts for years. So we, we pick them up you know, in specific time periods uh, over winter uh, in the entrances. Yeah. Yeah. Ben, since you're answering questions, I got one. You said the detection efficiency changes with ocean conditions. It can what, be, what do you mean? Like sea like, state? Uh, like sea state, okay. like okay. Uh, rough seas uh, gotcha. can, can change um, how efficient. But yeah, uh, you know, you're in the boat, you have the transducer cable below the keel of the boat, you upload the data um, onto the computer and then you just go on your merry way. Um, there are some pros to this because you essentially drop this receiver and then just leave it alone, uh, which is nice. Um, you know, cons, or this is, a, this is a more expensive design, mainly just because um, to fit a battery in there that will last over five years is very expensive uh, for these worms. This is a, um, this is one of our, uh, one of our receiver types. You can see the flotation collar here. Um, we moor these um, with uh, anchor chain and uh, tie up like a fuel hose uh, to the anchor weight and that's how we uh, send our receivers down to the, to the seat floor. Now some of our short-term moorings, are, they're short-term because they do need a new battery every year. Um, and you essentially just pop these up and download them via Bluetooth. And when I say pop up, uh, it's using a built-in release mechanism or a separate unit that releases is when, you, when you give it the code to. Um, these are great for areas that are not as dynamic, uh, so we have these in some of our spawning arrays, uh, Gravita, Hawkins Island area, also in the Southwest Passages areas, where it's just not as dynamic as Hitchin Book or Montague. It's uh, the pros; they are a slightly cheaper design, but the con is is that it is a yearly refurbishment, so you end up spending time and money doing that as well. Uh, there's a um, uh, one of our moorings, and uh, there's. Uh, our assistants, uh, Brad and Kirsty, uh, helping with the deployment of one of these moorings. Um, there's the anchor chain. The, uh, this is an acoustic release unit. Um, how that works is you just put over a transducer, type in a code, and it pops off this release lug here. And then the receiver comes up to the surface and you um, download it. <coughs> Um, just a picture of deployment. Um, the way we do this, this is Bainbridge Passage, I believe. Um, we have the boat fit with a crab or a, or a pot launcher uh, hooked into the hydraulic system. When we get about a quarter of a mile out to where we're trying to drop a receiver, we'll start trailing the buoy behind. And then someone's manning a GPS, and once it's time to drop it, we drop it. Um, before um, before these go out, though, there is some work, uh, pre-work that goes on to these uh, moorings. Um, some of the areas, specifically in the Southwest Passages, and, um, there's a high amount of biofouling. Bio when I say biofouling, we're, we're getting um, organisms that are settling onto our equipment, and this can uh, mess with both the buoyancy of the float and then the detection efficiency of the receivers. So we try and fight that as much as possible. And one, one method we found is using diaper paste, uh, and spreading diaper paste on to the uh, units because it has a high zinc oxide uh, content and it just kind of helps it kind of sloughs things off. Um, but even, even using that, uh, it doesn't always work. Uh, this is specifically, uh, Elrington Passage, um, 
has a super high level of biofouling. Um, this was in for a year from 2017 to 2018, and we did put diaper paste on it the year before. So in only one year, all of these barnacles and amphipods have colonized this, um, this mooring. And uh, so then that's part of the retrieval process. We pop these up. Um, you have to clean them off, refurbish them, um, and Ellington for, you know, it just seems to be quite a hot spot for this type of biological activity. Um, some of the uploading and how it works. Uh, so this is just what the workspace would look like in February. You've got your deck box here with a, with a transducer cable coming off of it, and then you're connected to a laptop and you're uploading detections um, from your receivers, some of which are moored and almost a thousand feet deep. And, um, so. uh, the other type of uploading we do are these units where we pop them up and bring them in, and then we just use a Bluetooth key to establish a connection with the computer and then read off the detection that way. Um, here's just the locations of where all of our receivers are in Prince William Sound. Um, in 2013, uh, with funding from the Ocean Tracking Network in Canada, we uh, put out 35 uh, receivers in uh, the major Prince William Sound entrances. So Hitchinbrook Entrance, Montague Strait, and then the Southwest Passages. And that's denoted by these uh, black circles here. In 2017, uh, we added 15 additional receivers with um, funding from the Exxon Valdez Oil Spill Trustee Council. And by doing so, we, we put these receivers on the uh, east and west sides of Hitchinbrook uh, and Montague. And uh, we did that because those areas are high, we found those to be high traffic areas for Heron. They're, they're kind of in that area, those areas quite a bit. Um, we also put them that way because by having this double gate, uh, an upper and lower receiver, you can get an idea of direction uh, and timing of going in and out of Prince William Sound or Gulf of Alaska, which was one of the, the objectives we wanted to do with this research. In 2018, we added eight more receivers uh, throughout various locations um, outside Redhead, Chamberlain Island, Northwest Montague Strait, and then Night Island Passage. And we did this to kind of get an idea of uh, movement corridors, uh, getting, uh, that way we can see where fish are moving, how fast they're moving between the entrances. And we also get an idea of if there are some herring that are just spending the entire year in Prince William Sound. Um, so we're excited, we just put those out. We're excited to see what we get back from that uh, this following year. And additionally, we have receivers deployed at spawning locations. Uh, in 2017 and 2018, we had uh, arrays put out at Port Gravina and uh, near Hawkins Island, uh, Canoe Pass, Cedar Bay. So at any given time, depending on season, we have about 85 receivers in Prince William Sound along with the associated infrastructure. So we have pretty good coverage. Yes? Then is, is there not much movement to the eastern side of the sound? Is that why those, there aren't any gates there? Or is there a reason behind that? In this area? Yeah. In this area? Um, well, I'd, I'd say the, the Shoals area, that it's just so shallow, we don't think they're moving through there at all. Okay. And um, we, yeah, we haven't had reason to believe that there's a lot of movement up into, let's say, Orca Amulet. Okay. So now, after we've gotten through all of that, um, so how do we do the tagging program? Uh, how do we tag the herring? Um, well, one of the keys is, is to minimize handling stress and the scaling. And the, the way that we do that is we use jigging as the primary, as the only method of catching these fish. And we find that the easiest time to catch them is pre-spawn. So they're in those big uh, spawning aggregations um, right, before, um, right before they're getting ready to spawn. And the past two years, we've been catching them mostly in Ravina and uh, Canoe Pass. And then there's Brad moving a fish over the jigs over to the uh, 
over to the holding tanks. Um, our holding tanks, we, we use what we call like a buddy system. Um, we uh, we catch, we'll catch as many, we'll catch quite a few fish, and then we'll only tag a few of them uh, or a certain proportion of them. But we'll keep the fish that we have tagged in these holding tanks with fish that have not received tags, and we call them buddies. But we find that. Uh, um, since they are a schooling fish, that it's, it's better to have them with others in tanks rather than alone, after, especially after surgery. So we find that this holding system and recovery system works quite well. Um, here is just some pictures of some of our fish that we've had and kept in the holding. And uh, I was going to say that we have a, so this double tank system it's uh, constantly pushing in fresh seawater um, via these uh, via these uh, hoses, and then it's got a spillway, so you're always getting fresh water in there for the fish. And then uh, there's just another picture here. So now I'm going to go through and show this video of a surgery. And what you're looking at here is uh, a tub that we've uh, put uh, anesthetizing, uh, it's a, an agent, an MS222 agent into it. And we've got fresh seawater in here. We've got an air stone in here that's uh, keeping the oxygen levels high inside the uh, anesthetizing bath here. And this fish looks like it's just gone under We'll get a standard length measurement on this fish and weight. And now we're taking it over to the surgery station. So these tagging cradles are custom built. They're like a PVC uh, pipe that's been fluted out with a uh, insert a neoprene sleeve to keep them from descaling. It has a uh, flow through valve that you can uh, work the flow on with a uh, um, aquarium pump. And the thought is, is what, it's, what it's doing is it's pushing the seawater over the gills of the fish while it's under anesthesia, keeping it breathing. We're making an incision here along the ventral line between the pelvic fins and the pectoral fins and trying to be as delicate as possible about the uh, cutting through the body cavity. These fish, when they're pre-spawn like this, have very prominent uh, gonads. So it's, you really have to be careful not to, to nick them. Um, and that's a uh, male, um, spawning male, pre-spawn. Now we're getting ready to insert a tag in and, and trying to do this as delicately as possible. Um, it's uh, you're trying to do it without pushing its you know gonads around or its insides. Um, and, then, and throughout the whole process, trying to keep this as sterile as possible. Um, and we use a monofilament suturing uh, material. We'll do two sutures. Here it can be tough trying to cut through with, it, with their scales and, and then pushing through with the needle through their scales can be difficult as well. But we do a uh, system of uh, just surgeon's loops basically here. Uh, couple of wraps around the forceps and then pulling through. What's the name of the tag here? <clears throat> These tags? Yeah. Uh, Vimco is the manufacturer. They're an acoustic uh, this transmitter. So, particularly, it's a, a V9 is what they're called. Okay, I'm gonna.
speed up through the second suture. How many grams of the tags? Um, we we have that listed in here. I'll have to get the exact specifics, um, but we try to keep it below a uh, below a four percent um, tag burden weight to tag ratio. Um, you know, it depends. It's a lot of times it's it really depends on how many we can catch. Uh, really, uh, it's, it can get tough to catch them at times unless we're just really, you know, really doing well. But um, I'd say we hardly ever tag more than sixty a day. Um, but yeah, this is, so. This is the recovery tank. And that's the end of the video. So afterwards, we just two sutures, a little bit of antibiotic gel, and then put them in a recovery tank. And they're in that recovery tank for uh, they're in that recovery tank um, until they um, have uh, well recovered from the surgery. But um, so after the surgery, they're put back in the tanks with the non-tag buddies. Uh, these fish uh, using a large net, so we're trying to release them as a school with all of their buddies that have not been tagged. And we release them uh, on or near a school, it will just look, you know, through acoustic, uh, or we'll have the captain find a school for us and we'll put them near them, and then release them as far away from a humpback as possible. <laughs> <laughs> swims through the array with the tag herring inside it when it came? I don't think it would. I think, I think the blubber would probably keep that from happening. <laughs> keep, a, keep the yeah. receiver from hearing right, it. Right, keep the receiver from hearing it. And now, Mary Ann's going to talk some about some of the results in the tagging um, over the past couple of years. Um, so tonight we're just focusing on the results from 2017 and 2018, but I'll just briefly mention that we first worked this technique out in 2012, and uh, at that point the uh, arrays weren't in, we just did it right around Port Covina. And in 2013 the arrays were in and we tagged 69 that year, and from that we could see they were going to the entrances, and that was kind of a pilot study, and then we got the um, hearing program to uh, invest in us for this study now. So we've had, we've tagged fish now the past two springs and have 344 fish out there tagged right now. Um, the Port Covina uh, was our main, only site that we tagged in 2017. They had a little bit of spawn at uh, Canoe Pass that year, but it was pretty late. We'd already been out on two separate trips to tag that year. But last year, things worked out great for us, and we were able to tag both at Port Covina and at, um, around the Canoe Pass area at Hawkins Island. So pretty even numbers of males and females, a few more females there, a few more males there at um, Hawkins Island in 2018, but for the most part, we should be about 50-50. Go ahead. So where are they going? Um, so, I should mention those 2017 fish were very skinny. They were coming off the block. And so when I looked at the fish that were over 230 millimeters length, compared their weights with the weights from the ones from 2013, they, they were like 50, I want to say at least 50 grams lighter. Big, big, big differences. So skinny fish, only 48% were detected at the entrances, which isn't terrible, but it was definitely less than we'd seen in 2013 when I think 65% oh, of the fish had shown up at the entrances. So uh, we start with this 124 fish. A majority, their first detection at an entrance was at Hinchinbrook entrance. So HE is Hinchinbrook entrance, MS is Montague Strait, SWP are the four southwest passages, Bainbridge, 
uh, Prince of Wales, Elmington, and Latouche going west to east. Um, a lot of the fish, we'd seen this before with the 2013 fish, they might go to Hingerbrook, but then they decide to go over to Montague Strait. And so 14 of those fish that first went to Hingerbrook went over to Montague Strait. Only one fish went from Montague Strait to Hingerbrook entrance. Um, do they go on the outside or do they go inside the sound to get over? We think they do a little bit of both. You know, we've seen uh, evidence of some fish going on the outside, but for the most part it appears more likely that they go from Hinchabrook just inside the sound uh, to over to Montague Strait. Um, a lot, there's a lot of movement between the fish, uh, between Montague Strait and the Southwest Passages going back and forth. And um, I'm gonna put those numbers in now. So uh, then we did see two fish go from Hinchabrook entrance over the Southwest Passages. So in all, 45 fish were detected at one point or another at Hinchbrook entrance, 28 at Montague Strait, and 19 at the Southwest Passages. What's interesting at the Southwest Passages is 17 of 19 were heard at Ellington Passage. None were heard at Bainbridge Passage. And uh, five, I think there were five heard at Prince of Wales and uh, four at Latouche. So, um, you know, we see some, I've seen fish like from 2013 where they one day were in Prince of Wales and the next day they were in Ellington. So there's a lot of movement in those passages. They're going in and out into Port Bainbridge, back up and down the, the different passages. So, so what- The few survivability of these are really high for these, these fish are getting tagged. I think so too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, considering, yeah, that they're running around with the tag, yeah, I think they're doing really well. Go ahead. Do the individual transmitters have different frequencies? Oh yeah, so you can tell the individuals. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, they each have their own little code. And for our, us to count it as a real detection, we have to hear it twice in one hour, basically. And um, so you might only get two detections in a day, but typically you might get 10, 15, 20 detections in a day, sometimes over 100. I mean, these are pinging every minute and a half. And if it's, it's staggered between, what is it, 60, 60 seconds and 180 or something, or 90 in a day, like you're not right now. Uh, but, um, so that they don't clash with each other. If they're with a school, let's say, and there are other fish that are tagged, because of that staggering, you'll be more likely to pick them both up, let's say, if there's two together. So anyways, um, so what's influencing movement? And when we did some stats on that, you know, is it size or is it sex? Or in our fish in poor body condition, less likely to move? Well, running some stats, uh, weight, to be most important. Um, in 2017, we had, I don't know if it's an anomaly or what, but there, we did see that sex played a role in movement, and particularly the males tended to move to the entrances. Uh, standard length was also uh, significant. Was not significant what little group you got released with. Um, condition, which was calculated by weight over length cubed, that was not significant, and the combination um, of weight and sex did not wasn't significant. So, weight basically the heavier you are, the more likely you are to move. This appears to be very important. Okay. So, um, looking at the 2017 weights uh, of the fish that moved versus didn't move. So, Gravina only means they were tagged to Gravina. That was the only place we ever heard them. Uh, and so they definitely weighed less, and not surprisingly, they were also smaller, uh, smaller in length. So uh, and here you see that, uh, that males, kind of surprising result that uh, males were more likely to move the, for the 2017 fish. We'll see it for 2018. Go ahead. So this 2017 group was the first time we've had the opportunity to see are the fish coming back to the spawning grounds before the batteries only lasted eight months. Well, now these new batteries last 25 months. So um, we were very excited. You know, our receivers in Ravina were only up by Hell's Hole, and so we didn't know what we might pick up. But sure enough, we had did pick up eight fish coming back to Port Ravina, some as early as November. 
Mm. And uh, where we might, one of the fish, I think I, two of the fish we heard like every month between November and April. They were definitely wintering in that area. And we've always known that there are some fish that winter like around outside of the redhead area. Um, and um, so three of the fish we had heard, last heard at Hinchinbrook Entrance came back to Gravina, four of them were last heard at Montague Strait before they came back to Gravina, only one from the Southwest Passages. And uh, eight of them went to Port Gravina, one was first heard at Hawkins Island. And then there was some movement between, uh, from Hawkins over to Port Gravina. So this is a little confusing, but it's, I think, important to see. So this is taking the last detection, <coughs> the, the most recent or final detection, whichever you want to call it, of the 2017 fish. And, I, and so Hinchinbrook, you can see a lot of those fish went to Hinchinbrook, and 50% of them were last heard somewhere between April and June. So we tag them, they go to the entrances, and then we don't hear from them. <coughs> and it might be because our big upload of the data is in February, and they might have come back later. And we've got some data to show on, on some fish that we actually did detect later that came back after that big upload. Uh, I mean, full upload of all the receivers. Uh, whereas the September uh, upload is just certain receivers on the outside, you know, what we think we're, we're going to get the most detections. and because it takes a long time to upload. And some of the Southwest Passages, for example, we don't upload at all, except once a year, because you have to pop them. So, um, so you've got 50% of the fish that are only heard for a couple of months, and 25 of those fish, you know, about 30 fish in all, uh, that left during that time or whatever, they were last heard at the outermost receivers, so we think they were in fact going on in the Gulf of Alaska. Um, and then you can see like some of these fish coming back and showing up in Gravina. Some of them that we picked up after spawning on our partial upload in September at Montague Strait then. Okay. So 2018, our 2017 class was dominated by a little three and four year olds that didn't weigh much and we had a we really had a hard time getting 923 fish tagged in 2017 that we felt were big enough even for the tags. And um, so the, what the fish we ended up tagging were more like seven and eight years old. And so for 2018, we said, we're gonna try and um, tag a cohort of them, of the smaller fish, the smaller tags, even though those batteries have a shorter life. We wanna see what was going on with these smaller fish. So the smaller fish weighed about 32 grams less, their length was about 16 millimeters less, and they also had a much lower tag burden. And tag burden is uh, um, the weight of the tag over their weight. And so um, we tagged 142 with the larger tags that we'd used in 2017. Those weigh 4.7 grams, and then we put out 60 tags of the 2.0 tags, and you can see then the standard length differences there and the weight differences there, those two tags. So what happened with those tags? These are very preliminary results, and these are from the partial upload, so they'll change once we get all the data back uh, this spring. Go ahead. So 202 fish were tagged. Of those, 102 went down to Hinchbrook entrance, including all of the small fish that moved, all, I mean all the fish with the small tags, they all went to Hinchinbrook entrance. All, I think it was 36 of them or whatever, that moved all, only went to, first went to Hinchinbrook entrance. Some of them did move after that, but the 36 that we picked up only went to Hinchinbrook entrance for their first detection. Uh, 22 went over to Montague Strait, five, there might be more, we'll see, this was we happen to have a receiver recovered that I uh, popped and we couldn't find uh, that did show up then my kayaker found it so that we have a little bit of data from Southwest Passages from that. You can see again, uh, high numbers moved from Hinchinbrook entrance over to Montague Strait. Only one fish again moved over Montague Strait to Hinchinbrook entrance and then that movement again between Montague Strait and Southwest Passages. So what's interesting I think is that 
65% of the large tag fish moved, the smaller fish 60% moved, comparing that with that 48% in 2017. So I think the fish were just in better condition, you know, or healthier, heavier in 2018. So, okay, Ben. Okay. <clears throat> So we did get some data from um, some fish that we tagged in uh, 2017. We had nine that returned, kind of, we had data on for a uh, full hearing migration cycle. Uh, picked uh, three here to kind of show uh, a couple of animations to you guys about where we were seeing them during the times of the year. Let me get out here. So that's the Gravina array. Uh, this fish in particular was a six-year-old male, and we're basing that six-year uh, by uh, some of uh, Fish and Game's uh, data set that we've got um, from 73 until uh, now. Uh, so <coughs> kind of getting approximation there, but we're saying this one was about six years old. It was tagged. Um, April 11th of 2017, and it left Gravina about April 16. And you'll see here that it arrived in Montague by about a month later. Um, and it stuck around Montague for about three months, and then it was not heard from again until April of 2018. And in April of 2018, right after that, it moved uh, straight to Gravina on the 22nd. And it was at Gravina and then the uh, Canoe Pass area uh, for a while. So it went to uh, Gravina on April 22nd, and it left um, Canoe Pass on the 30th, and then went back down to Montague. What's interesting with this one was that, well, we didn't see it for eight months, and then it showed up in Hitchinbrook, immediately went to Gravina and Canoe Pass, but we actually, this one missed spawning, because spawning was uh, the 7th and 8th of April in Gravina this past year, and it was the 16th and 17th that Canoe passed this past year. So this one uh, apparently missed those two events. Let me go to another one here. So this fish was an eight-year-old um, that was tagged um, April 15th. 2017. It uh, exhibited some different uh, tendencies here. It actually stayed in Gravina for two months after it was tagged um, before um, moving to Hinchinbrook um, in late June, stayed there through July, and arrived over to Montague by early August of 2017. Only stayed there for a few days and then went over to Ellington and back to Montague <clears throat> and sort of stuck around Montague all the way through the uh, beginning of March. And um, right about that time after March, it uh, moved to Urbina um, right around spawning time. Uh, the, right before pre-spawn, 3rd and 5th of April. And we last heard it in Montague of uh, July this past year. And I'll show one more. Um, this one was a age 9 plus, and all of these were males. Um, and this one in particular was noted as a spawned out male. 
And once it was tagged, it was tagged on the 16th of April and it left the day after. I mean, it left on the 17th and went straight to uh, Hinchin Road. Um, and then hung around at Hinchinbrook for a few days and then went over to Montague and then went over to Ellington and then Latouche. And what was interesting with this one is, remember before I talked about that double acoustic gate so we can tell direction and uh, if, where they're, you know, what timing, if they're going into the Gulf of Alaska. Well, this one in particular in Latouche, it last picked up on a uh, southern receiver, um, a lower receiver, and then was next picked up, picked up two months later in Montague by a lower receiver. So this one went out uh, into the Gulf, at least some way, somewhere in the Gulf, and then came back into Montague Strait. And it hung around in Montague um, for a couple of months and then left Montague by a lower receiver, so out into the Gulf of Alaska. Mm -hmm and then did not show up again in our array until Montague in uh, January. So this, this fish spent almost six months in the Gulf, we think, uh, over winter. And it showed up and left Montague around uh, March 1st, and then went right to Canoe Pass to spawn right on the right day, the 15th of April. Uh, so interesting that that one did go into the Gulf and instead of going back to where it spawned in Gravina, it went straight to Canoe Pass. So um, really all of that to say that um, it's, it's a very uh, variable um, uh, undertaking to understand the hairy migration cycle. Um, they are exhibiting a lot of different um, behaviors throughout the year, and it's in our hopes that through, uh, you know, continue putting out more transmitters and, and uh, supplementing our uh, arrays that we'll get um, more um, more insight into. Uh, what's going on here. But it is, it's some exciting stuff to see and we, and we look forward to finding out more, especially after we do this upload in, uh, in uh, February, March uh, that's coming up. And we are going to put out uh, another 240 tags uh, during the spawn season, um, a mixture of both the smaller and larger tags. And then we'll do another partial upload in September 2019. So we're really starting to piece together some of the some of the puzzle now. So it's it's uh, really interesting stuff. Um, and with that uh, we do want to acknowledge all of those that have helped or funded um, with this project, our tagging and array personnel, uh, Brad Reynolds, uh, Christy Jerfe and Shaper, um, funding uh, through the Ocean Tracking Network and Dalhousie University of Canada. Uh, the Exxon Valdez Oil Spill Trustee Council, uh, thanks to Scott, uh, Pagal, Stormy, um, the, uh, Rob Campbell, the New Wave, um, Dave Anderson, Solstice, uh, Ken Jones and Serenity, Dave Beam of uh, Montague, and uh, Dave Jenkins of the Aqua. And uh, with that, we'll take some questions. So do you have any evidence of the fish that were released together in a group ever being found with another fish in that group on any of your resamplings, like even within a couple of days of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've had fish show up together. I, I have to look to see if they came with this, if they were released at the same time, but I know we've had fish showing up together at the entrances at the same so time. So some of the groups may have, the buddies may have stayed buddied up. Kind of yeah, thing. and for example, that fish that stayed in Gravina for two months, well, through June, there was a whole group of them, there were about five of them that sat there until June, and then suddenly all moved to Hinchinbrook entrance. And whereas we hadn't seen that before in 2013, they all uh, pretty much just left Korean after they spawned. But there was a little group in 2017 that stayed two months. <laughs> yes. Was that fish that you showed that um, appeared to miss those major spawning events? Is that is that the only one that you've seen that I've seen? 
Well, well, we'll see once we get the full upload if there's more like that. Right. But, you know, now there is see. that idea that of skip spine, yeah. so mm -hmm. it might be our first evidence. Mm -hmm. That or the tag. No, I've been hearing you know, that since There I'm might sure be tag effect, down. too. Yeah. Who knows? Right. But we did have some fish coming back and showing up at the right time that think they're spawning. Do you guys have any mobile receivers that you might be able to look for fish like out in the Gulf, you know, if you have opportunistic? Well, know. we're going to put one out on the sewer line. Oh, okay, really? Yeah, well, mm. they said we could, so um, both at the end of it. The, the GAC-13? The GAC-13 and then the one right outside of the... In the GAC-1 in yeah. front of the Bear Glacier? Yeah. Right, so the, the two spots, they said we can hang one off, so we're going to get that to them this spring. That's kind of west of here, yeah. you know. But so I mean, will the receiver like GAC-13 have a really strong amplifier, pick up a signal from farther away maybe? No, no, okay. no, receiver, no, it's the tag. It's, it's pretty far out, you know, Yeah, this is the tag, yeah. and so, but, you know, really tag's got to be within about 500, 700. But feet. occasionally there are those eddies, you know, and what, what if the herring were attracted to those eddies? I mean, the GAC-13, it looked just like Prince William Sound, all of drab water. In, in May, so yeah, know. you know that might be a good source of food for herring. But I so. haven't, you know, you can't really have a receiver on a moving boat. So let's say I couldn't okay. have the UAF folks do it with all their new work that they're doing yeah. out there. But they'd have to stop the boat. Could they do it if they stopped the boat and lowered the line? Yeah, but I think they're doing so many other things at the same time. Kate, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, but. Um, <laughs> If you're going really slow, I guess you could try to listen. But we send, like we've sent it out with Janka's boat when they were doing Hatchery Wild. We've sent out receivers. I mean, basically, if somebody's going out, we usually try to get them a receiver. Yeah, especially if we're anchored up, you know, yeah. all day. Yeah. But we've never had a hit on an anchor. A hit being a detection. Yeah, well, it gives you some more coverage from, from just the arrays. Right. So the age structure is so young, you know, I mean, not an age class in three, then 17 and four this year. How many do you have to jig to bag 220? I'd say two and a half times that. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Well, 217, that batch, you guys gave us a batch, and most of those we couldn't tag. Mm -hmm. So it might have been maybe three times for that. Huh, it makes me wonder yeah. if the jigging is, do you think the jigging is size selected for, for larger fish? Mm. Well, it, it might be, yeah. It's slower though. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in this year we definitely caught more males and I don't know if it was just, you know, we were at Cavity catching free spawn and the males coming first kind of thing or what, but that's the first time that's happened, 2018, definitely preponderance of males. But we're coming in for another warm spring, so I'm a little worried. I'm hoping they're not skinny like 2017. I mean, those were skinny. Well, you saw them. They were skinny, skinny fish. I mean, 2018, they looked a lot better. So. They looked better, but there was less of them, I see. Yeah, yeah. That, too. That's an issue. So when you're looking at these areas, you're like, okay, which one am I going to put a tag here? Are you looking for the like, larger, stronger fish that maybe would better off with a tag? Well, we go by weight, yeah. I mean, like, the, the bigger tags, typically we want them over uh, 200 millimeters and over 100 grams. But, um, like, those smaller tags, we were putting them down to, I think, 85 grams was the smallest one we put them to. Oh, yeah, I can't that or something. Yeah. Um, so it's selected that way, but it's more, yes, yeah, so that the tag burden doesn't become too much. Although, when I've looked at tag burden, it didn't seem to make that much difference. Yeah, I, I was amazed at how many of those fish survived. You're saying the size of the tag burden. Some of the smallest fish yeah. still showed up with the big tag at Southwest Passages, you know. It's, I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, it determines it. Well, thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. And we'll have more results in another year. <laughs>